Welcome to the 2005 Scylla Lecture. My name is Jane Kirtley, and I'm the director of the Scylla Center for the Study of Media Ethics and Law here at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication. I bring you greetings from the director of our School of Journalism, Al Timms, who unfortunately was not able to be with us tonight. I'd like to take just a moment to formally acknowledge our donors, the late Otto Scylla and his wife, Helen, whose generosity is responsible for the endowment of the Scylla Center, the Scylla Professorship, and tonight's lecture. Helen is with us tonight, together with her daughter, Alice, and some of her grandchildren, and I hope you'll join me in thanking them all for making this possible. I'd like to make just one short announcement before I go into my introduction of tonight's lecturer, which is the one you always hear in live performances. If you have a cell phone, may I ask that you either turn it off or switch it to vibrate. Thank you very much. I didn't mean you to take it personally. <laughs> this year marks a very special anniversary. It is the 20th annual Scylla Lecture. We pride ourselves in addressing media law and ethics issues that are both profound and timely. But seldom has the phrase ripped from today's headlines been as apt as it is tonight. We are honored that you have joined us to share our speaker's reflections on one of the most contested topics in media ethics and law today. Should the law grant journalists a privilege to protect their confidential sources? And legal consideration apart, should journalists promise sources confidentiality? And if they do, what ethical obligations do journalists have to protect those sources, even if doing so means they will go to jail? Once upon a time, these questions seemed more theoretical than real. But this is no longer true, as the headlines of the last few weeks have reminded us. If you think back a couple of years to the original column by Robert Novak that identified Valerie Plame as a CIA operative, it's easy now to see that it lit the slow fuse that seems about to explode in our faces. You may recall that when the first calls for an investigation into the leak of this information appeared in the press, including, ironically enough, in the New York Times. Robert Novak swore that he would never reveal his sources. But that defiant statement was uttered with the comfortable assurance that relatively few reporters had spent any time in prison for refusing to break their promises to their sources. 31 states, including Minnesota, as well as the District of Columbia, have journalist shield laws, and every state, with the exception of Wyoming, has recognized some form of statutory or common law protection for the press. Until recently, most journalists assumed that the First Amendment also provided a powerful, if not absolute, weapon to fight any attempt to undermine the news media's independence by forcing them to turn state's evidence. Now, the last time the U.S. Supreme Court considered the question, in its 1972 ruling in Brandsburg versus Hayes, it actually ruled against the journalists who had actually witnessed criminal activity. But even so, some courts have interpreted this decision as recognizing at least a qualified privilege in other situations. But in the last two years, federal appeals courts in the first, fifth, seventh, and DC circuits have questioned whether any constitutional or even common law privilege exists. Judges seem skeptical and even hostile to the idea, rejecting the suggestion that the public interest would actually be enhanced by granting rights to the press not enjoyed by the public. As one influential jurist put it, we do not see why there needs to be a special criteria merely because the possessor of the documents or other evidence sought happens to be a journalist. This judicial attitude illustrates a point that was made by our lecturer tonight in a quotation that's been memorialized in the 2006 Freedom Forum First Amendment calendar, which I just received in the mail today. He said, the First Amendment is not self-executing. We need judges to apply it and thus breathe life into it. And he should know. Floyd Abrams is truly a legend among the media bar and among the journalists that those lawyers defend. He has been called synonymous with the First Amendment. With a career spanning more than four decades, beginning with his role as co-counsel for the New York Times in the Pentagon Papers case, virtually every significant First Amendment case has had Floyd Abrams' fingerprints on it. It is no accident that he has been counsel to both Matt Cooper and Judith Miller in their ongoing battle to protect their sources in the Valerie Plame case. They wanted the best, and they got it with Floyd Abrams. <laughs> 
He is a widely quoted commentator on the First Amendment, has appeared frequently on television in programs ranging from Nightline to The Daily Show. He's a partner in the New York law firm of Cahill, Gordon, and Rendell, and is the William J. Brennan Visiting Professor of First Amendment Law at the Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. Floyd is also the author of a new book, Speaking Freely, Trials of the First Amendment, and he will be happy to sign copies of the book, which will be available for purchase during the reception in the atrium following tonight's lecture. It is now my pleasure and my privilege to present the attorney who may be most responsible for running the resuscitation equipment that breathes life into the First Amendment. Our 2005 Silla Lecturer, Floyd Abrams. <clears throat> Thank you, Jane. I was afraid she was about to say who may be most responsible for the jailing of his client recently. <laughs> but uh, no, she was, she's too nice. Thank you to the Silla family for uh, sponsoring these lectures uh, for the last 20 years, and thank you for inviting me to deliver this one. And thank you for the place of the lecture. I should tell you that uh, I did advance work for Senator Humphrey uh, when he ran for president in 1968 on a variety of occasions when he was in New York, that I did a thesis at my law school on Senator Humphrey and the adoption of a law called the uh, Communist Control Act of 1954. Not his best moment, but, uh, <laughs> but worth uh, 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 an effort, at least, at a good essay. And it's especially nice to be here. I'm going to talk this evening about uh, confidential sources, uh, offering some historical views and some views of my own. Many of these views are obviously uh, affected by my own experiences in representing Judith Miller and Matt Cooper through the Court of Appeals uh, in the cases in which they were involved, and Judith Miller uh, at, as co-counsel during her time in jail uh, thereafter. Um, and I'm going to offer some conclusions at the end, uh, at least a few of which are more optimistic than uh, many people offer. Um, one of them is that uh, only because Judith Miller was prepared to go to jail and did go to jail, does it now seem reasonably likely that the Congress will adopt some sort of federal shield law? Uh, and a second is that only because uh, she was willing to go to jail and did go to jail, will the public, I think, be more willing, not less, uh, to trust journalists with confidential information uh, and with their own uh, confidential uh, status. But let me start uh, a little bit uh, historically. First, you should know two things about the history of journalists and confidential sources in this country. The first is that the journalistic view that they should be able to make a promise of confidentiality to a source and keep it goes well back, even before the revolution itself. In 1734, when John Peter Zenger was tried in New York City for seditious libel, for writing critical things of the English colonial governor of New York. Uh, he was jailed for about a year and a half pending his trial. His trial is in all the history books because it is the first time in American history, albeit prior to the revolution, the first time in American history that somebody was tried for seditious libel, saying bad things about people in power, uh, and acquitted uh, by a jury in circumstances in which the jury was told truth is no defense, and in which the defense lawyer argued truth as a defense. And the jury thought what he had said about the colonial governor was true, uh, and they acquitted him. But while he was in prison uh, for that year and a half, uh, the English made enormous efforts to try to pressure him into telling them who his sources had been for the very articles criticizing uh, 
the uh, Crown's representative in New York, and he refused to do so. And they offered a reward in New York City to anyone who would come forward and reveal the identity of his sources, uh, and no one came forward. At around the same time, Benjamin Franklin was a very young man, uh, in about 15 or 16 years old, and working for his brother for a newspaper that his brother had started in Philadelphia. They were both subpoenaed to testify before a Pennsylvania uh, body that wanted to know the confidential sources of information who had said critical things about the English leadership in Pennsylvania who were running that state. Uh, his brother refused to testify and was jailed for some period of time, less than a month. Uh, Franklin himself refused to testify and was not jailed, as he wrote at the, at the time. Uh, they thought he was too young to put him in jail, and they thought he was just doing what his brother told him to do anyway. But it goes way back in our history that journalists should have believed and acted on the belief that they could promise confidentiality to sources and that they should not uh, reveal those sources. What is much newer is the claim that that is protected by the First Amendment. And that is so for a lot of reasons. For one thing, the First Amendment did not apply to the states at all until the late 1920s, and early 1930s. Until that time, states could do anything they wanted vis-a-vis -vis free speech or free press or freedom of religion, so long as it was consistent with the state constitution. But there was no federal protection at all in this area until after the amendments were passed, after the Civil War, which expanded significantly the scope of legal protection, and then, in fact, until the late 1920s when the Supreme Court said that the protections of the First Amendment and of uh, a number of the Bill of Rights protected against state action as well as federal action. Beyond that, the broader reading of the First Amendment that began uh, after World War II and particularly in the 1960s and 70s made possible a much stronger argument that the First Amendment should be held to provide protection for the press. And so it was not until uh, cases came up to the Supreme Court uh, in the early 1970s and an argument was held in 1972 in the case called Brandsburg versus Hayes, uh, mentioned by Jane, that the Supreme Court, for the first and still only time, came to address the issue of whether there was or was not First Amendment protection for confidential sources uh, of journalists. The Brandsburg case really involved three cases, but I'll mention only one of them in terms of its facts. Paul Brandsburg was a Louisville, Kentucky journalist who had the idea to write about how easy it was for hashish to be made sold, distributed around Louisville. Uh, and he talked to one of the people who was involved uh, in, in all of that, who agreed that he could come with them, see how they made it, see how they distributed it, see how they sold it, so long as he promised not to disclose who the people were that he was seeing uh, on this uh, agreed upon basis. He published an article uh, in a Louisville newspaper. And the next day, the local district attorney issued a subpoena to him to come testify in front of a grand jury. No effort was made to do any investigation about hashish. The only investigation was of the journalist for having written the story. And Brandsburg was called before a grand jury in Kentucky. He refused to answer questions asking him to reveal his confidential sources. He was ordered jailed, and his case and two other cases uh, went up to the Supreme Court at the same time. And they were both, they were all three decided together in 1972. 
Now, I remember that argument. It was only the second argument I'd ever seen uh, in the Supreme Court. And a few things about it uh, remain very, very clear to me. Uh, one was that the lawyer who represented the city of Louisville was a very young lawyer, but even younger than I was when I was there, and I was 36 or something. Uh, and he looked even younger than he was. And he came in to argue, and he took out his papers, and he looked up at the court, and before he said a word, Justice Douglas, who very rarely asked questions, said, uh, let me ask you something. He said, do you think it's proper in a case of this magnitude to give this, this court a brief of only four pages? And there was sort of light laughter in the courtroom. And Douglas went on. And do you think it's proper to give us a brief that doesn't cite a single case decided by this court? And there was more sort of embarrassed laughter in the background. And the young lawyer looked up at him and said, well, Justice Douglas, you have to realize I'm a very busy man. <laughs> and now there was raucous laughter in the courtroom. And the lawyer said, and I did write a brief. He said, but you have to understand, I work on 200 cases at once. Well, I gave you the best brief I could. Well, I've always thought about that guy. Someday I'm going to bump into him as I give this speech uh, about the case. And I've always thought about him because he won. He won his case five to four in the Supreme Court. And I always thought that he must have gone back to Louisville and said, you know, they all laughed at me. The judges laughed at me. The audience laughed at me. Newspapers made fun of me. And I won. And so he did. But how much did he win? That is the issue lawyers like me have been arguing ever since 1972. And that is because the Brandsburg decision is not just one opinion, not just two opinions, but in a very relevant way, three opinions. First, there was an opinion of five members of the court. You know the math. Justice Brennan used to say, the most important thing to know about the Supreme Court is how to count to five. <laughs> and he said, and there were five votes joining an opinion written by Justice White, really ridiculing the idea that the press really needed or was entitled to a confidential source protection. Uh, sometimes the opinion really got very biting uh, in its tone. Uh, it did say, look, if, if Congress wants to pass a law, fine. If the states want to have legislation, fine. But in effect, don't come to us and ask us to create a privilege for the press when you really haven't shown on any serious empirical basis that the press really needs it, and you certainly haven't shown that historically the press had it at the time of the revolution or the like five votes. Then there were four in a very strong dissenting opinion written by Justice Stewart, uh, in which he said, in effect, that the opinion of the majority of the court, he used the word, was a crabbed opinion, which simply did not take account of the needs of the press and the public. The press to gather news, which it could sometimes do only by promising confidentiality and the public to get the news that the press would gather uh, in that way. Five to four. And Justice Stewart said there should be a balancing test. Why don't we establish a test which would at least put the press at the end of the line, make the government go first to everyone else that could have the information, and make the government prove that it's really important to have this information and make them prove they can't get it any other way. So it's not an absolute protection he was seeking, but a sort of a, a balance to be struck. And then Justice Lewis Powell, who had just been appointed to the court, was a very new member, wrote a separate opinion, 
He had joined the five-person opinion. He was one of the five who had signed on to Justice White's opinion. And let me read to you in relevant part what Justice Powell had to say. He wrote, I add this brief statement to emphasize what seems to me to be the limited nature of the court's holding. The court does not hold that newsmen subpoenaed to testify before a grand jury are without constitutional rights with respect to the gathering of news or in safeguarding their sources. Certainly we do not hold, as suggested by Justice Stewart in the dissenting opinion, that state and federal authorities are free to annex the news media as an investigative arm of government. The solicitude repeatedly shown by this court for the First Amendment should be sufficient assurance against any such effort, even if one seriously believed that the media, properly free and untrammeled in the full sense of these terms, were not able to protect themselves. And he concluded, the court states that no harassment of newsmen will be uh, tolerated. If a newsman believes that a grand jury investigation is not being conducted in good faith, he is not without remedy. And then he said, indeed, if the newsman is called to give information bearing only a remote and tenuous relationship to the subject of the investigation, or if he has some other reason to believe that his testimony implicates confidential source relationships without a legitimate need of law enforcement, he will have access to the court on a motion to quash. The asserted claim to privilege should be judged on its facts by the striking of a proper balance between freedom of the press and the obligation of all citizens to give relevant testimony with respect to criminal conduct. The balance of these vital constitutional and societal interests on a case-by-case -case basis accords with the tried and traditional way of adjudicating such questions. Well, said the lawyers who do this sort of thing for a living, what are we to make of that? There were five votes against us, but he was one of them. He was a necessary vote of the five. If that's what he thinks, why can't we add his vote to the four who dissented? Why can't we argue to the courts later on there were four dissenters, and Justice Powell is obviously the critical vote, and he is saying that there should be a case-by-case -case analysis, a case-by-case -case balance to be struck in every case between freedom of the press and the obligation of all citizens to give relevant testimony. So maybe we didn't win. Maybe we didn't get the test that Justice Stewart and the four dissenters said, but we got something, didn't we? That issue has been argued in court after court, in case after case, ever since 1972. And the courts disagree. They disagreed from the start. They disagreed today. By the 1980s, there was a significant amount of courts that had said, Justice Powell carries the day. Through the 1990s, there were many courts, but fewer, saying that. And into the 2000s, fewer courts have said that. As of now, in civil cases, not criminal cases, most federal courts still say there is a balancing test to be struck. Read Justice Powell's opinion. In criminal cases, the courts are about evenly divided, the federal courts, with a majority so far saying, no, in criminal cases, there is no privilege and there is no balancing. But a number of court of appeals saying, yes, there is. In grand jury situations, where it's not a criminal trial, but an appearance of a journalist in front of a grand jury, like Judy Miller, a majority of courts have said there is no protection, but then a number of courts that have said there is protection in the criminal area at the same time have said, and the same is true for grand juries as well, 
So we have confusion, disagreement uh, from one federal court to another. Uh, in New York, where I live, the Federal Court of Appeals uh, that sits in New York, Connecticut, Vermont, is much more protective of the press than is the case in Illinois, say, where the case that Jane read to you from uh, uh, is in the, in the Seventh Circuit. And in different places in the country, the law remains different. That's just in federal courts. In state courts, you have, a lot of you have a lot of states, 49, as Jane told you, in which there's a good deal of legal protection for the press. 31 states have statutes. Another 18 judges have made decisions. So in a significant majority of state cases now, there is legal protection in the state courts, but not in the federal courts when they're deciding federal questions. I've been involved myself uh, in a few uh, noteworthy, sometimes notorious, confidential source cases. And I'd like to offer you some views of my own and recollections of my own as to what I think I've learned from them. The first case in which I was involved, which involved potential prison for my client, and in fact, ultimate jailing of my client, was in 1978 in a case involving a New York Times reporter named Myron Farber. Mr. Farber had written a series of articles for the Times describing the suspicions of a number of doctors in a small New Jersey hospital who had come to believe that another doctor in that hospital was murdering their patients. Over 25 patients had died in very suspicious circumstances. And the doctors had begun to suspect another doctor of ministering peyote to their patients uh, in an amount which killed them. The other doctor denied it. Farber wrote a series of stories about this in the New York Times. And eventually, the doctor, first called Dr. X by the New York Times, and then named Dr. Jaskalovich was his name, a doctor from Argentina. Um, Dr. Jaskalovich was indicted and accused of first degree murder in a courthouse in New Jersey. And I remember going to court in those days because Mr. Farber was subpoenaed to testify. This was not a grand jury, this was a criminal trial. And he was subpoenaed to testify by the defense. They said, we want to know who told you that Dr. Jaskalovich had done this or that, or that he was suspected of doing this or that. Farber refused to answer. Relying on a shield law in New Jersey, which at that point said, journalists may not be held in contempt of court for refusing to reveal confidential sources, period. An absolute protection uh, of journalists. He also cited the First Amendment, uh, but uh, we didn't really need it uh, in that case. And the defense lawyer was very smart. He called the doctors to the stand, all of them, all the doctors, including Farber's sources. And he would ask them on the stand, did you ever speak to Mr. Farber? And some of them said no, falsely. Some of them said yes. And he said, well, did you ever ask Mr. Farber not to reveal anything you said to him? And some of them said no, falsely. And they were all asked, do you have any objection to Mr. Farber answering any question I ask him? about anything you said to him. And they all said, all of them, no, no problem at all. Then he called Farber back to the stand. And he said, were you here when Dr. So-and-so testified? Yeah. You heard Dr. So-and-so? Yes. You heard Dr. So-and-so? You heard Nurse So-and-so? Yes, yes, yes. 
Or now I want to ask you, tell us everything that you and Dr. So-and-so said to each other. And Farber said what his lawyer had told him to say. I respectfully declined to answer on the grounds of the New Jersey Shield Law and the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. And everybody looked at him as if he was crazy. The doctors had just testified that it was all right. And now Farber was getting on the stand and saying, no, I won't answer the question. Now, the reason that he was saying no was he knew that these were the same doctors who had asked him for confidentiality. So he knew that when they said it was all right for him to testify, that they didn't mean it, or at least he couldn't trust them to mean it. And so he asserted the privilege, which was then uh, uh, the subject. He was held in contempt of court for, for refusing to answer, and he was put in jail, uh, in a jail uh, not far from the place the trial was held, and ultimately held in jail for 40 days uh, until the trial ended. And at that point, there was no, no point in keeping him in jail anymore, and he had to be released, uh, and he was released. The New York Times was fined $285,000, $5,000 a day for not forcing Farber to turn over his notes, that is to say, not firing him if he didn't turn over his notes, uh, and not pressuring him to turn over his notes. Uh, after the case was over, the governor of New Jersey pardoned the Times for, the, for, a, for that part of the penalty that he could control and they got back uh, $100,000 that they paid, but, uh, but not the rest. My, my most enduring memory of that case is arguing in the New Jersey Supreme Court and arguing in a state which, as I've said, had a shield law which was written down, clear as can be on the books of New Jersey. And in fact, in New Jersey, all shield laws are in the same book, the same law book. Shield laws saying a lawyer like me doesn't have to reveal what the client tells me. A shield law saying a priest, a rabbi, uh, doesn't have to reveal what a, someone he's ministering to tells him. A uh, shield law saying a husband or wife uh, can't be forced to testify uh, against each other. Uh, and some other uh, areas as well. And I was arguing in the Supreme Court of New Jersey, and one of the judges, the chief judge, formerly the, the governor of New Jersey, Richard Hughes, was uh, very angry at me, at my client, at the New York Times, uh, for not playing the game, as he saw it, not participating. Uh, I had just said that we were relying on the New Jersey Shield Law. Here's what it said. He said, Mr. Abrams, don't you understand? Someone is on trial for his life. He could be executed. And he could be executed because your client is not providing the name of his source. How can you tell us that? And I finally said, Chief Judge Hughes, I know the name of the source. I know it right here today because my client told it to me so I could represent him. You wouldn't think of asking me the name. It's still a first-degree murder case. I'm still a person with, it, with relevant information. But you wouldn't think of making me answer the question because I'm a lawyer. Because you understand, we all share the sense that it's so important for clients to be able to talk to lawyers that we simply take that off the table and say, we don't care how important it is, the information the client gives the lawyer. We don't care how important it is. Even in this first degree murder trial, it would be unthinkable for you to say, we need you to tell us the name. And he responded by saying, yeah, but we're talking about a journalist. <laughs> and I learned something that day. Um, and what I learned is that uh, logic alone will not carry the day. Um, uh, eventually, what the court said, 
is that the New Jersey Shield Law was itself unconstitutional when a defendant needed the testimony. That is to say that a journalist could not rely on the plain language of the law which said he didn't have to answer questions uh, if the material was important to the defense, precisely what he would not have said and the court would not have said uh, if uh, this was uh, me, say, or someone else with a privilege. Um, so uh, the Farber case wound up with Farber in jail, as I've said, for 40 days. Incidentally, one of the arguments, the argument we made first in the Supreme Court was not a First Amendment argument. It was a due process, sort of a fairness argument in which we said surely Farber was entitled to rely on the New Jersey Shield Law. Even if you later said it was unconstitutional, you can't put someone in jail for relying on a, a statute of the state of New Jersey. Uh, the Supreme Court did not uh, hear the case. Um, the next case that I did involving jailing of journalists was the Judy Miller case. You all know that case, uh, and that of course started uh, not having anything to do with Judy Miller, but started with Robert Novak uh, publishing the name uh, of an individual named Valerie Plame, who was married to a former American ambassador named uh, Joseph Wilson. Wilson had written an article in the New York Times and this is all very relevant now and, and for the next, next few days as we wait to see if, if there will be indictments. Wilson had written articles in, uh, an article in the New York Times which was very critical of President Bush uh, and of the Vice President. And it basically said, President Bush said in his 2003 State of the Union message that according to British intelligence, uh, that uh, Saddam Hussein, we, we were not at war in January 03, Saddam Hussein had sought to purchase uranium, uh, which is useful for building atomic weapons, in the African country of Niger. Wilson wrote, I was the one the CIA sent to Niger to find out if that was true. And I wrote a report saying I couldn't find any basis for that. And yet the president still goes on television and tells people that, that that is the fact and that is a major reason for going to war uh, with Iraq. When people in the administration were asked uh, their reactions to what Wilson had written, um, a few of them at least, uh, in the course of their answer, essentially denounced Wilson and did so in part by saying, George Tenet, the head of the CIA, never heard of this guy. This guy tells you, you know, he went off, he did this big report to the CIA. First of all, it was very low level. Uh, Tenet didn't even know he went, which is true, by the way. And second, his wife sent him. It was his wife, because she's in the CIA. And maybe people said, maybe they didn't. She's a CIA operative. That was the word that Novak used in his column. It's not clear quite how they described uh, uh, his wife's role in the CIA, which has some legal implications. But in any event, the point was, don't take this guy so seriously. This guy was criticizing the president and the vice president, that this is the guy who was sent there by his own wife not by the CIA, if by that you mean the head of the CIA, etc. The truth, as it turned out, was that his wife had said to uh, her, uh, the leader of the entity within the agency, and, uh, uh, that her husband would be a good choice. He had been an ambassador there, he had good uh, ties there, and he was chosen, not by the wife, but by the entity within the agency uh, that uh, was involved in it. And so he went, he wrote a report, uh, and uh, uh, it turns out that the journalists who spoke to the people in the administration 
did so, having promised confidential treatment to them, which is, in many cases, the only way people in the government, in the Defense Department, in the CIA, in Homeland Security, uh, in every place that deals with national security, the only basis upon which people will speak to journalists at all. And so, when Novak published his article, and the CIA itself was very angry at the idea of a journalist who incidentally had been warned by the agency not to publish the name, um, uh, the CIA was very upset, did an internal study, contacted the Department of Justice to ask them to look into it. And the fact of Novak's column, of course, became widely known. It was a column um, and widely criticized, mentioning a CIA agent, identifying her as a CIA operative involved with weapons of mass destruction. Many in the press, including the New York Times, uh, as Jane pointed out, urged an investigation, a serious investigation not an investigation run by uh, uh, Sir, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft, an independent person running the investigation. The Department of Justice started to look into it themselves. Then Attorney General Ashcroft announced he was recusing, he was bowing out uh, himself, uh, and that uh, he was uh, going to appoint someone to take his place. Uh, and he appointed uh, Patrick Fitzgerald, the United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois, uh, someone who was very well regarded uh, by people of uh, both parties, a very serious man, a very non-political person. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, his worst critics would not say that he was political. They might say he is too prosecutorial, but not that, that he does things for political reasons. And Fitzgerald has conducted this investigation, which finally led to questioning of the president himself, questioning of a, a Secretary of State Powell in front of the grand jury, uh, and questioning, attempts to question, journalists, a lot of journalists. A number of journalists reached uh, uh, an agreement uh, with uh, Mr. Fitzgerald that they would testify on a limited basis uh, on the basis, at least in part, of a document that the entire White House staff had distributed to it. It was a, what's called a waiver form. It's a typed document that basically says, if I ask any journalists for confidential treatment, I don't ask it anymore. In fact, any journalist I ask, I now urge testify fully. And among others, Mr. Libby, the, the chief of staff to the vice president, signed that. Mr. Rove, the chief domestic policy advisor to the president, signed that. Uh, and just about everyone else uh, in and around them uh, signed that. And the question that came up for me pretty early when I started representing Judy Miller was this. What should we make of that document? You could read it and just say, I can testify. On the other hand, should you view the document the same way Farber viewed the people who lied in front of him uh, in court for the same reasons that they got confidentiality? They sought confidentiality because they didn't want it to be known they were speaking, and they told the court they had no deal with Farber because they didn't want it to be known that, that, that they were speaking. I can put it a little more strongly. When I called uh, Mr. Libby's lawyer and asked him, essentially, what do you want of Judy Miller? What does your client want her to do? One of the things that troubled me most was that I knew then, and I came to know even more later on, but the one answer he couldn't give me was he wants her to be quiet. He wants her not to testify. 
Why couldn't he give it? That's obstruction of justice. That's a crime to tell someone who's been subpoenaed in front of a grand jury not to talk. So then what was I asking him? Well, let's see. I asked him first, what is your client's position as to what he wants Judy to do? Answer, well, he signed this form, and consistent with the form, we're telling all reporters, and I'm telling you now about Judy, that she can go ahead and testify. I said, yeah, but isn't the form coerced? And he said, well, of course it's coerced. How could it not be coerced? He'll, he'll be fired if he doesn't sign it just as he'd be fired if he took the Fifth Amendment. So sure, it's coerced, but you can go ahead. Well, that left us um, up, up in the air. Um, and there were other negotiations I won't go into now with the, uh, uh, with the federal prosecutor, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald, which also didn't work out, and so there was no need to go back again and ask him again. There was also a lot of reluctance on Miller's part to go back to a source again and ask him again um, if, uh, if she could testify or, or not. So the issue of coercion uh, is a very difficult one in circumstances like these. Um, most other journalists uh, were prepared to rely uh, upon the written document. Uh, she was not. Uh, I'm not here to tell you they were wrong, but only to urge on you that I thought then and I think now that she was extremely principled to insist on a much clearer waiver than the one that I got on the phone. And it was not until she had been in jail for 85 days that, or 80 days by then, that uh, what she wanted to have happen finally happened, and that is she conveyed through her criminal law counsel uh, to uh, Libby's lawyer, look, the only thing, I, I don't want lawyer-to-lawyer -lawyer conversations, and I don't want a coerced piece of paper. If he wants me to talk, have him pick up the phone and call me. I know him. He's not a stranger. He's been quiet for 80 days while I've been in prison. If he wants me to talk, have him visit me in prison and tell me. Or have him call me on the phone and tell me. And then I'll decide if I think he means it. Now, at around the same time, the prosecutor, Mr. Fitzgerald, wrote a letter that I must say Mr. Libby must have viewed as deeply troubling. He wrote a letter saying, I have been watching with great interest the failure of Miller to testify about Libby. And by the way, he knew not from anything Miller had written that she had talked to Libby because she wrote nothing. She never wrote an article about this. He knew because Libby had testified in the grand jury about talking to her. So he had her name that way. Um, and in uh, Fitzgerald's letter, which he wrote on uh, September 12th, he said, and I've noticed that uh, Mr. Abrams has said publicly a few times that uh, uh, he doesn't have a clean waiver, a really personal waiver from Libby to Miller, and that you did not answer. And I've noticed that a uh, congressman from Detroit uh, sat on the floor of Congress and was then joined by six or seven other Democrats uh, in saying on the floor of Congress, why doesn't Mr. Libby come forward and give Judith Miller a waiver which is personal, directed at her, in whatever form she thinks she needs to go and testify? And Fitzgerald wrote, so the only thing I could conclude from all this is that you've decided that it's not in your interest to testify. On the other hand, he said, I've read some other stuff in the press recently saying that maybe you would think that I would think it was an obstruction of justice if uh, 
you called Miller. And I just want you to know, I won't think that. I don't want you to tell me if you called her. I'm not putting pressure on you. But, but, but I just want you to know, it will not be an obstruction of justice if, if your client decides to, to call. And so, uh, either because of that or something else, he finally called. She talked to him for 15 minutes with two lawyers on the line. She was persuaded. He seemed to mean it. In fact, for the first time, he was not saying it's okay to testify. He was saying, I want you to testify. Please testify. Um, and so she did. My modest point after all that is simply to say it's not easy to know when a confidential source in circumstances like this is waving or not waving or has been coerced or not coerced uh, to, to, to issue a waiver. Second, I think it's very important to realize that the courts ought not to be distinguishing between good leaks and bad leaks. The sort of case everyone would love on my side of the line, of course, would be a whistleblower, somebody exposing government misconduct. Judy Miller didn't do that. Judy, Judy Miller didn't write an article. They, no one uh, uh, that, that heard from the administration officials uh, heard from them in a sense of whistleblowing. They were speaking to condemn Wilson, not whistleblowing. And so some people have said, well, that's sort of a, a bad leak. We, we don't like leaks of CIA uh, uh, officers' names. So we shouldn't protect journalists in that case. Uh, my own view uh, is that, uh, for one thing, the journalist doesn't know what the answer to the question she asks is when she asks it. That is to say, the journalist asks, well, what's your answer to Wilson? And if, the, and if part of the answer to what's your answer to Wilson is, well, his wife's in the CIA, and you've already promised confidentiality, you're stuck. Or at least you're stuck if, as I believe, journalists ought to keep their word uh, in circumstances uh, like this. Beyond that, the whole purpose of this protection is to encourage people to talk to journalists so that journalists can report to the public. And if we have to wait until a judge decides later on if it's a good leak or a bad leak, the public won't know whether they can talk to journalists because journalists won't know what promise uh, they can make. In the same way, I think it's important to recognize that the decision about whether or not there should be legal protection here shouldn't be on whether the public was ultimately served, benefited by the identification of the leaker. There was a case here in Minnesota which went to the Supreme Court not so many years ago uh, in which a young journalist asked a candidate for lieutenant governor uh, a question and the, the candidate basically said to her privately, look, I'll tell you something about my opponent if you promise not to attribute it to me really good stuff. She said, all right. And he gave her a criminal record of her, his opponent as a juvenile being arrested for shoplifting. So she goes back to her office, shows it to her editor. The editor says, this is crap. I don't want this. The story I want to run is we've got a guy running for lieutenant governor who's smearing his opponent. That's the story. She said, but you can't do that. That's the promise I made, is not to reveal who it is. But that's the story, he said. And he ran the story, and a jury in this state awarded over $300,000 to the candidate who lost after that article was written about him. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's constitutional. If, if that's what Minnesota wants to do, Minnesota can impose that sort of fine, as it were, on the person for doing that. Finally, it's very important in my view not to allow the decision about confidential sources to be politicized. An awful lot of recent criticism of Judy Miller arises out of earlier writing that she did, 
sometimes incorrect writing that she did about weapons of mass destruction, in which she, uh, citing confidential sources, very high up, including scientific sources, diplomatic sources, military sources. She argued, in a, in a way, again and again, or presented the administration's case before and during and even after the war in Iraq that there were weapons of mass destruction there. The, the Times later ran an article basically apologizing, saying that they had not been sufficiently skeptical uh, of those uh, statements. But it seems to me that it is very important not to mix the two the dis distinguishable matters between the, the, because of political or ideological uh, anger uh, over the journalism uh, involved. So what's the result, finally, of the Judy Miller case? I, I started out and I conclude the same way. We lost the legal battle. In the District of Columbia now, it is clear that journalists who appear in front of federal grand juries, at least those conducted in good faith, have no legal protection at all to refuse to answer questions, none. The law is different elsewhere in the country, as I've said. 